All right, good morning, everybody. Looks like we got close to 50 people on board this morning. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Chris Demers. I'm the Florida Land Steward Coordinator. I coordinate the Florida Land Steward Extension Program at the University of Florida IFAS School of Forest, Fisheries, and Geomatic Science, for, uh, formerly known as the School of Forest Resources and Conservation. We're undergoing, undergoing a name change as we speak. Um, so welcome to our, our webinar. I should acknowledge, I must acknowledge that this uh, webinar was initiated by the uh, Florida Forest Service for the purpose of providing some continuing education for their foresters so they can get up to speed on uh, the latest in forest herbicide technology. So we welcome the Florida Forest Service foresters uh, to the webinar today. It looks like we had about uh, 20 to 25 signed up yesterday and there's probably more than that this morning. So welcome everyone. Go ahead and advance that first slide, Pat, if you would. Um, I want to ask everybody to uh, please use the question and answer uh, function to, to ask questions today. I'll be monitoring that um, don't use the chat to answer questions. You can use the chat to chat, but use the Q&A to, uh, to ask questions and we'll monitor that and we'll answer all questions after uh, Pat Minogue's presentation. Next slide, Pat. Uh, we are approved for a Society of American Foresters uh, continuing forestry education credits. Um, we've got one uh, CFE approved and that will be monitored by the, uh, by the Zoom webinar attendance log. So if you've attended all of the, uh, the webinar, you'll get that credit. We also have one FDAX uh, pesticide applicator CEU in those categories listed there. Um, if you need CEU credit, I'm gonna need you to email me your pesticide license and then I'll need to input that on the, uh, on the, on the DAX uh, site and get, get you situated. So drop me an email, cdemers at ufl.edu. Uh, that email is also in the reminder email that you got today and also in the, the email that'll come out tomorrow. Um, so if you need FDAX, pesticide applicator, CEUs, uh, contact me and we'll get you those. Um, next slide, Pat. Also, um, at the end of the webinar, there will be an evaluation that automatically should come up after you uh, complete the, the session. 
please fill that out. That helps us to, uh, to report impacts and get some feedback from you. All the presentation slides for this are available on our Land Steward website at that link. And that link is also in the reminder email that you got today and the one that you'll get tomorrow. So you'll have access to the slides. Um, and that, I think that pretty much takes care of my introductory comments. I wanna thank uh, Dr. Pat Minogue for his time presenting for us today. He's got a lot of great updates and great information for us uh, to get everybody up to speed on the latest in herbicide technology. So Pat, without further ado, thank you. Thank you much, very, very much, uh, Chris. And I'm glad to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, we have quite a large audience right now, and I see a lot of people are joining right now. We have a lot of folks that have had a lot of experience with vegetation management and, and pine production. We have some folks that have some specific questions that they wanted to ask, and we have some folks that uh, that maybe this is somewhat new to. And my, my goal today is to give something for everybody here with the information that I'm providing. I'll, um, I'll have some basic things about terms that will be very common to some of the uh, practicing foresters, but I think we need to be on the same page with terminology. This particular graph really tells a great story. And what has happened over a period, as you see on the bar graphs here, from 1940 to 2010, there has been a decrease in the pulpwood rotation age from, oh, 48 to about 20 years or less over that period. And at the same time, there's been an increase in total yield. And what this is saying is that silviculture, advances in silviculture have really not only reduced the time it takes to produce wood, but also producing more during that time. Let's look at part of the same study by Fox and Jokola and Annalyn. These are soil scientists, very, uh, very well known. This shows the same data, same harvest volume, tons per acre there on the left. And you see from 1940, 2010, that increase in volume. And what the authors have done here is they've attributed each of the different practices that have come into play during that time for that increase in productivity, starting with just a natural stand, 1940. You, you cut what you have, right? And then the 50s, we started to plant and that uh, brought some increase. And then as we came into the 60s, weed control became a part of it. And then on some, uh, so on with fertilization, I see they show a large increase for fertilization. I know they like that a lot. <laughs> Tree improvement, that's adding with every generation more and more productivity. And in the recent years, clonal and biotech has really improved our, our productivity and the actually the value and quality of the wood that we're producing. Today, I wanna to talk about the various areas for herbicide use in silviculture. And we're gonna focus mostly on pine production. That's our title, but I, I do want to emphasize that vegetation management is important for other objectives. We're gonna talk with, about site preparation, which is really, <laughs> a very important part that really sets a stage for success. Herbaceous weed control, which came into play during the 1980s, HWC is what we call that commonly, pine release. And for our purposes, we're gonna be talking about brush control. And then 
mid rotation release also came into play during the 1980s. And we're going to talk about two main ways that we do that with aerial broadcast broadcast and also understory applications. And then I'm going to close with some information about timber and habitat improvement, which uh, can certainly uh, be consistent with pine production. Look at this picture here. We see broom sedge. We used to think of this as a, as a weed, but if we're in longleaf eco ecosystem restoration, then there's a reason to try to keep it. And that's something I'm really enjoying now in, in my career, doing a lot of teaching and re research in uh, restoration ecology. And there are selective herbicides like ALS that can release broom sedge and wiregrass. And fire, of course, is a part of that. Okay, a little bit of um, housekeeping, some terminology. We're going to talk about herbicides with respect to their generic name, sometimes called the common name, and of course the trade name. For example, for Arsenal, that's the product. The generic name or common name is a mab mazapir. So there's a lot of products out there that have mazapir now. It's off patent. But if we can keep track of the generic name or the common name, some of, some of them are not generic yet, then we can, we can make a decision between the different products. Uh, also, we need to know the difference between foliar or soil active uptake. Uh, foliar herbicides are those that just go through the leaves. Roundup is a great example. Goes through the leaves, doesn't go through the roots. Soil active herbicides are uptaken by the roots and often are very persistent. Many herbicides, arsenal is a good example of one that is absorbed by both foliar and soil active. Then we need to distinguish between pre or post emergence. Pre emergence, that's before the weeds come up. You know, it's kind of like a weed preventer. That's the best way I, I try to describe that. And we'll talk about some specifics there, particularly in herbaceous weed control. And then post emergence, those are herbicides which are going to be effective on established weeds like arsenal or Roundup. Okay, Pers persistence, how long it lasts in the environment. And, and that's affected by many things, including the, in the uh, amount of moisture available in the soil. Microbial activity is very important in breaking down the herbicide molecules into, uh, into molecules that are not herbicide active, and also sunlight is active in them. Selectiv selectivity, that's one of my, my most favorite words because it's extremely important in making decisions in choice of herbicides and the practice of vegetation management for different objectives. Selected selectivity just basic, basically means that the herbicide will, will affect one plant, but another, but not another. And we'll revisit that. Revisit that. <clears throat> toxicity, that's very important. Obviously, we're concerned about toxicity to ourselves, to, to wildlife. Uh, and, and that is something that is important to understand. Often that is a, uh, a affected by the, the amount, the rate that's being used, but inherently these different products have different toxicity, toxicity. And for the purpose of forestry herbicides, most of them are very low toxicity. And we'll get into that a little bit. And then environmental fate. We are stewards. We have to be very concerned. We're very concerned about the effect on our groundwater 
and to uh, in to, to many many aspects, and that's largely determined by the water solubility, the persistence of the material, of course, the toxicity of the material, and then of course the mode of action. Uh, mode of action just tells us how the how the herbicide works. You know, uh, hexazinum felpar product that affects photosynthesis. Well, we don't do that in, in our bodies. So the site of action really isn't important to us. Most of the uh, products that we use in forestry, almost all of them have uh, actions that don't occur within our, our own system. Okay, site prep, that is really, the key to success in pine production. We have objectives there. One, soil conditions. A lot of our sites are compacted. We have poor drain sites. Herbicides do not do anything to do that, to improve that. We can't ameliorate those situations with herbicides. That's why we use mechanical site preparation. And in particular, in the coastal plain with uh, polar, polar drain soil, the, the use of equipment is extremely important, important. We have a lot of folks I know uh, on the list here that are joining us from other states and the Piedmont throughout the Southeast. And so, you know, it, it, it's still uh, a practice to use machinery and herbicides in site preparation throughout the Southeast. One thing that's changed um, since the mid 70s when I started uh, practicing as a forester is that our objective has really shifted at site prep from managing competition, and, but also to promote desired species. And again, that, uh, that speaks to that concept of selectivity of products. Another thing that we, consider in site preparation is that it's important for natural regeneration, i.e. from seed trees, et cetera, and also in artificial. And by that, I mean that we're planting seedlings. This is some old information that when I was at Auburn, uh, Dr. Glover and, Glover and Zutter revisited a study by Whipple and White which was done in the 1970s. And they looked at about seven different site preparation treatments. And after three years, they, uh, they measured the number of hardwood rootstocks at age three, okay? And on the bottom axis, you, axis, you see the density from 1,000 to over 5,000 stems per acre. I can tell you from, <laughs> Uh, having had the job of actually determining how many rootstocks per acre you have, it's, it, it's not a lot of hardwood to have a thousand roots, uh, rootstocks per acre. But when we look at the resulting basal area in pine at age 70, and this is in uh, square feet, we see that there's a very sharp drop off with increase of hardwood density. So this makes the point that a small amount of hardwood will affect your pine producti productivity. I have to add to this that this was done in the Piedmont and in, in particular in the northern part of the state where hardwood competition is very heavy with tree forming uh, trees. And this was done during a time when Basically, uh, the land was being largely occupied by hardwood, and we were trying to convert that to, to, um, to pine. And that was very much the case through the 1960s, really to the early 80s. And at that time, site prep really changed because we were going into places we have already changed the stocking to pine and were replanting to pine made the whole process simple, uh, easier. But uh, in a way, 
I think that in, in, in the current situation, particularly in places in the coastal plain where it's shrubs, uh, the, the density is, isn't that, that dramatic, okay? Okay, <clears throat> so for site prep, uh, I mentioned we want to manage both the brush and the herbaceous weed controls. And we can done that with burning or without burning. Some sites we don't want to burn, like I'm working on some university property right against the interstate. I will burn piles, but I don't want to do a broadcast out there. Uh, and we can also plant it by hand or by machine. Obviously, if you look at the top or top uh, picture there, that, that would not be something you could plant with machinery without additional pushing and, and moving some of that out of the way. So that would be a hand plant. So it really depends on the site. We're gonna talk about application periods during the spring, summer, and fall. We have options through the growing seasons. And as I've already mentioned, we're combining with mechanical treatments, particularly for bedding, on, on poorly drained areas and for compacted sites. This is very important in a lot of the Piedmont where we're doing ripping and disking and we're gonna get into that too. Okay, this was updated uh, just this month and uh, there's been a lot of changes in labels and there are a lot of options out there, but these are the most common site prep treatments that we are using. And note here that I show the uh, herbicide generic name and the trade name. So there are many, many gen generics for these products. Also, I show the product rate per acre for the three major species that we're growing. Note that the rates are the same for those three species. Now, here's the issue the selectivity to these species are different. So you have to adjust your rate within that range. I want to point out two other things on this slide. Those that are bolded here have persistence and are soil active. We're concerned about carryover from site prep to the pine stand that we're going to plant. And it's going to be a matter of timing and rate. If we use a high rate at the end of the, of the application period in middle of October, we're gonna have more carryover. If we use the same rate earlier, we're gonna go back to that. And I wanna point out for metsulfuron or Escort, other generics, that is not labeled for longleaf in any way because of tolerance. Okay, site prep. Uh, spring period, we used to do a lot with solids, uh, Velpar, particularly ULW. We used to use grid balls, uh, solid pellets. And these uh, treatments with the solids were great for sandy soils, where oaks were predominant. A lot of the coastal plain is like that. This is a soil active herbicide. It's taken up by the root. It moves up the xylem. It moves predominantly in the xylem, okay? So that's the route that water moves from the roots up into the top. We used to use a lot of wetter, wet pot, wetter pot, uh, wetting pot powder and also Velpar, Velpar L as a foliar uh, back in the, in the 70s. Uh, and we would brown up the tops and let everything would re-sprout. And then Larry Nelson, one day we decided we'd get some kitty litter. He figured if we could get a solid, we could make Velpar work for brute brush control, and it did. And very soon after that, we saw Pronome come out of a solid formulation than ULW. Currently, there is no solid formulation except power pellet, which is made uh, at a, a very concentration pellet. It's okay for individual stem treatment, some restoration activities, we use that. It's extremely expensive. It's generally prohibitive for, for operational forestry. So right now what we're doing is we're using the ground uh, application of the 
liquids in a, in a solution um, to the ground around individual stems. And I'll come to that towards the end of the presentation. Our uh, other uh, period where we do actually most of the work now is during the summer and early full, uh, fall with foliar sprays. Now, there are a lot of different treatments that are out there and to make it easier to understand, I'm gonna break it into two main uh, cases. One, upland sites where we've got oak, hickory, sweet gum, maple, et cetera, or flatwoods, coastal plain sites where we've got a lot of gallbladder, gallberry, uh, saw palmetto, liona, and tai tai, yopon, other waxy leaf species are common. In the case of upland, about 80% of the sites, uh, combinations of chopper, which is a mazapir, or a cord, which is glyphosate in many different products. Those combinations are the most common. And I've shown a sort of a middle rate right there. Now in the flatwoods, we still like the amazapir in that mix, but we need to work against the, the waxy species. And for that, there are a lot of options, but one that's most common is Darwin, uh, which is more effective in absorption through the waxy cuticle. Now, just recently, a group of us from I don't know if you can see me or not, <laughs> but uh, we put together this paper together. Uh, it was an effort. This is, I think this is the fourth or fifth time that we revised this. It's based on research uh, that I did and others have done over the last 35 years to try to refine rates for imazapir which again is the arsenal chopper type product. Here I show products, product rates per acre for chopper gen two, and the suggested rate for loblolly pine uh, based on the application day, day, whether we start in June, July, August, September, October, or the planting date in November, December, February. So if we're starting application early and we plant early, then we can use a higher rate. But as we go to later application and, uh, and early planting, we can't use that uh, because it, there's not enough time for the herbicide to dissipate. Now we have, this is just one example of the, of the matrix that we've done for loblolly slash longleaf based on soil texture. And uh, it's seen a lot of attention through the years. I just wanted to point out that we, we spent most of the summer going through this again to revise that. And you see the link right there where you can get, it's, a, it's an extension publication from the University of Florida and also the University of Georgia. Okay, another thing we do in site prep was we try to enhance the fuels for prescribed burning. And to simplify this, the thing I looked at first are, you know, are our fuels gonna be predominantly grasses? In which case I'm looking at a tank mix with glyphosate, Accord, Roundup, et cetera. But if it's broadleaf, then I'm gonna wanna mix in something like triclopyr, which is the garlon, 2,4-D, which is a very inexpensive old herbicide. It's a broadleaf herbicide. Uh, some of the new materials, Milestone VN+, Plus, which is amino pyrrolid with triclopyr, which will increase our fuels and broadleaves. And I'm gonna add, there's a lot of products that work in these cases. I just, you know, for the purpose of getting this idea of, of getting fuels uh, prior to doing your site prep, we can, uh, burning, we can do this 
with the, the herbicide application. We can manipulate fuels. All right, special situations in pine production, uh, blackberry is a problem. A mazapir arsenal chopper uh, that will release blackberry. And uh, I know I spent a lot of time doing research after mazapir, and I have a lot of, uh, uh, of very fond memories of blackberry being a real problem. But we have ways that we can uh, address that with a tank mix. One is to add one ounce of Escort. That gives pretty good control for about a year. Garlon works very well, about one a quart, one and a, and a half uh, of a quart of Garlon. That's the ester form. And also Milestone, which is uh, a, labeled in Florida and many of the Southeast states under a 24C state special local need label. And we're going to revisit that later. I'm going to talk about that particular and also some new chemistry that's coming along right now towards the end. I'm going to keep uh, information about new products for the last. And then pine control, that's always a challenge. This is a shot from uh, actually from rights of way where pine control is an issue for them because it can be a problem for fire and getting into the transom, transom to the vines. Uh, and foresters say, why do we want to kill pines? Well, a lot of times we want better genetics, we want different species. Right now we're trying to get rid of sand pine in a lot of uh, the area I'm operating in the panhandle and uh, trying to, to move those areas into longleaf. And we deal with sand pine, which is very difficult to control. There are some, uh, some herbicides that are effective. The key here is treat pines when they're growing active. Use high volumes of, of carrier to get good coverage. Uh, consider adding methylated seed oil as a surfactant, which improves absorption. I'm gonna come back to that again, uh, but that's, that's a key to do it during the spring, high volume, get good coverage, and it's gonna take high rates. It's difficult to control pine. We usually in forestry, at least we can come in and, and we can burn afterwards. So if we can get the pines down and then, and then uh, burn through it and get rid of the residual pine, We've, uh, we've accomplished what we want to do. Okay, in the flatwoods, machinery, big, big equipment. Here is a shot of the uh, Savannah plow. We we'll do a lot where we do one pass or two pat, uh, passes for bedding in the coastal plain. These are really poorly drained soils, autosols. They're characterized by an organic layer. And uh, one thing that's happened in the last oh, couple of day, couple of days, decades, um, is to instead of doing two bedding paths, sometimes a lot of places we can just do one pass and then do a band treatment of herbicide, pre-plant site prep herbicide right over the top. And I want to talk about that for those that are working in the coastal plain. This is done during the summertime to allow the beds to settle. Uh, prior to planting. Okay, herbaceous weed control. Uh, this is a shot from the Flatwoods, some of my research plots look at different combinations of materials to improve selectivity and better growth for slash pine and other pines in, in the Flatwoods. This is a practice which I watched grow up uh, in the 1980s when I was at Auburn. We were, were screening a lot of herbicides for tolerance over the top. Um, David South was uh, working in the nursery co-op, Larry Nelson, myself, and others working in pine silviculture. And we came up with a lot of new herbicides which were selected right over the top. Arsenal came out of that, ALS, Escort others came out of that, that program. It, the applications are made in the spring, starting in February in the coastal plain, towards the end of February. April's a good month, early uh, month, early April in the coastal plain to May. Longleaf 
we plan a little bit later, and I'll explain, explain that in a little bit. Typically, we're using a six foot wide band over the rows, right over the top, we have selectivity. And we've looked at a lot of research about what size of a band, generally a six foot wide band is best. Some people use something narrow. You get many times the broadleaves will go right over the top of that and canopy out your pines. When sometimes, you know, we have a lot of places that are uh, hand planted and there's no row into in no rows, uh, or where we have a lot of vines, grass sod, old pasture areas where access is difficult, or sometimes in large areas where there's a scale of, uh, of uh, operation that affects the cost, then in those cases we can often do a broadcast. A lot of that's done with helicopter. An important point I want you to remember is that wait at least one month after planting before you go over the top of the pines. That's something that, that we learned that through operations. I don't know of any research that really showed that, but we sure did figure it out. You know, the pines have to get over the transplant shock, so let them get their roots started. And I'm gonna come back to that in particular for longleaf. Okay, now why do we want to control herbaceous weeds? When I was uh, coming out forestry school in, in the mid 70s, we thought, <laughs> I remember a lot of the forests were saying, oh, the herbaceous, the grasses and all that, that's the nurse crop, you know, just be worried about the brush because that'll overtop all the pines and it'll you know, the pines aren't gonna be able to grow. They're not gonna have straight light. They're, they're not gonna produce a, a stand, which is true, but actually uh, you know, competition matters. That seems to be a really common thing to say right now. During that period too, well, I guess through the eighties, uh, Jim Miller and, and a group from other and other universities. I was part of that effort. We put in studies across the Southeast. I think there are 13 sites. I know I put six of them in myself. And we looked at the effect of woody control, herbaceous weed control, or total control, just to see what is the effect of hardwood or herbaceous. And if you look at the far right on merchantable volume, you see that with total control, on average, we had three tons per acre per year, per year, uh, more yield than for the non-treated. And I can tell you that the degree of control that we got on that study, on those studies were not that great. They were distant, we were getting there, not all the time, you know, we didn't have the tools that we have now. So if anything, this is an underestimate, uh, underestimates what the yield, also genetics has changed a lot since that time. Okay, there's a lot of products for herbaceous weed control. These are the most common ones that we have. Uh, hexazinone, again, is a soil active. Actually, all of these are soil active materials. And you see there are some standalone uh, treatments and also there are some combinations. There are many, many um, products that are available, but these are the most commonly used. And you have this information. I hope you'll take the opportunity to, uh, to download this presentation. The stuff is up to date and work very hard to put together. And that'll give you something you can refer to. Okay, um, slash pine. Here we began in the coastal plain February through mid April. Common treatments there are combinations of oust and arsenic. And that's what I go to is a, a go to treatment. A lot of times also I'll use combinations of oust and Velpar, that's sulfur metron and hexazinone, whereas oust and arsenal is sulfur metron plus a mazic here. And then Alstar is a combination of sulfometron plus uh, hexazinone. And you see the common rates that we use for slash, which is predominantly in the coastal plain. 
Now with Arsenal, I like to use that if I've got a lot of perennial grasses because in Mazapir, Arsenal, it will have a lot better control of our grasses. Whereas Alice is very good for the broadleaves. That's why we put them together. And we put these herbicide types together based on what they're effective on. And the rates are limited by the tolerance of our crop trees. When you're using Velpar, be sure you look at the label very careful, carefully. And the label does a good job of describing the rate for different soil types. Generally, as you have sandy sites, you use less hexazinone. Loblolly pine, there again, similar type treatments as we saw before. I would note here that with loblolly, it is the most of the southern pines with respect to tolerance to imazapur arsenal. So it's very, very tolerant. Uh, the, the first application of the Mazapir I did in Camp Hill, Alabama, and I used two pounds of, of uh, Mazapir and four pounds of, of Mazapir because with 245T at that time, we did everything with two pounds. So I figured, well, I'll do two pounds and then four pounds that will have a 2X. Right now, uh, when we go to do weed control over young pines right now, we're using 0 0.12 pounds <laughs> over the top. But even in that case, we didn't have much mortality at all. I stunted a few, and it was incredible the tolerance that we had in, in, uh, in that species. Okay, longleaf, one of my favorites. Again, we plant this uh, and let the roots grow. Check for new growth on the roots. And for that reason, we'll often will wait till, I like to do it in April if I can, but I'll, sometimes I'll wait as late as mid-May in the coastal plain, make that a little earlier. But the, the, the main point is make sure that you plant these early and let them get the roots started. In a lot of cases, the roots aren't there. We go over the top, it, we don't have any problem, but we're better off if they get past the transplant. Do not add a surfactant with, with longleaf because it's, the selectivity is not as good. It's more sensitive. And uh, for that reason, don't put a surfactant there. i just touch on pasture conversion here. And that, this applies to all the species here. Do site prep before pasture con conversion if you possibly can. If not, do some scaffolding, scaffolding and mechanical, um, sometimes even bedding, to open things up and to, to uh, begin control of the, of the uh, turf. Uh, particularly if you have Bermuda grass, that is a very difficult species to control post plant. Okay, pine release, and this is the control of brush. Uh, this is an old picture from the Piedmont from the 80s, and that was very typical. That's what all of our plantations look like, a lot of brush. Again, we were still in the race where we're converting hardwood to pine areas and the root stocks, you know, the incredible amount of underground rootstock material that was producing sprouts. But here we were doing uh, applications over the top, typically in the second to fifth year. We also do release during the mid rotation period, criteria, uh, period usually about 10, uh, age 10 to maybe 17, 18, depending on your timing for harvest. Uh, if you're in a long rotation, the, the key point is to, to know that it's going to take some time after your release for your pine stand to fill in to get a response from that release and produce wood that's going to improve your profitability. This is done with broadcast application aerially by helicopter for the most part and also ground sprayers. We can go under the ground under the canopy and I'll show you some examples of that in just a minute. For release, these are selective herbicides. There's a lot of them. The most common 
is imazapir, the arsenal product, and also uh, directed applications of milestone is coming into play. And I'll talk about that in particular. We've also got some directed spray uh, uh, treatments with glyphosate, used to be used over the top and it was labeled for that, not any longer. The tolerance just wasn't that good. But at one point we were struggling for something to replace 245T and 24DP also is for a directed application. And I'll describe that more. Basically, you're gonna, you're gonna apply it to the target canopy, the brush, and avoid the pine. Okay, for pine release, the labeled rates here are shown for the different species. You can see that for Virginia, Virginia pine, Loblolly pine, the rates are higher. These aren't the rates that are, are often are used, but they can be in some uh, situations. The best time uh, to do release is from mid-August to mid-October. That's because of translocation characteristics. Uh, Imazapir arsenal will move to the roots, to the rootstocks of the hardwood late in season. And that has to the fact that uh, the source sink relationship for that molecule looks like uh, a nitrogen containing material, which the tree is trying to save all the nitrogen, move it down into the roots before it loses its leaves. So a mazapir will get to the root then better in the fall. And uh, for slash and long leaf that's more susceptible, we do treatments between age two and five, and then we stop until about age 10. As the crown gets larger and that relationship, the selectivity, changes, particularly with slash and for, for uh, long leaf, which is very sensitive. During that period, our tolerance is not good. Now, once the trees get past 10 years, and that's what's on the label, then the, the tree is larger, more vigorous, and then you can go over the top again. It, at that point, it's typically under understory or uh, aerial uh, broadcast. So with loblolly, 16 ounce rate is the usual with, uh, with slash pine. I usually use six, uh, about 14 ounces, but typically for slash pine, for longleaf pine in the coastal plain, I keep it the, uh, the rate at 12 ounces per acre on those sandy soils. Some things that are not controlled by a mazapir include elm, red bud, 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 locust, Blackberry, blackberry, definitely blackberry is released. And we can do some tank mix. I already talked about that. Uh, escort, sometimes we have some of the leguminous species like locust and mimosa. Escort is a, a tank mix at a half to one ounce per acre. Backpack directed uh, foliar sprays. This, this uh, uh, application, method is really best for a small brush, uh, less than four feet tall. The label will say less than six. And, and really, uh, particularly if you're doing this in a stand, you, you've got to recognize if you're spraying at six feet, you're spraying a, a, an area beyond that brand and you're gonna affect your other, other uh, pine trees. So, uh, you know, it's smaller brush. It's easier to operate in a site like that. Also, where your root st stock is not too density, uh, dense, about 1,500 roots, root stock per acre. Uh, typical is a, a good, good situation where it's if a good, you know, reasonable to do that from backpack. Uh, application volume, we tend to use a low volume approach not a lot of volume. And the reason for that is we have to carry the water on our back. And so we use low volume technique, which means that we don't have to wet down the, the foliage and the concentration as such. But, you know, with a good crew, and here's one right here is doing a right of way, they, they can really dial in to gallons per, gallons per acre pretty well. There's a lot of experience out there, particularly in the West uh, west of the U.S. 
you see there are some of the common herbicides. We've talked about those already. And I'll take this opportunity to point out the PPE. We're all into PPE now. I don't have my mask, but I'm staying at home. I've been here since last March. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, uh, PPE. Here, these fellows are, are wearing gloves. Uh, they've got long sleeve shirt, pants. I see they got brush pants, you know, snack, snake leggings, you know, that's just smart. That's not on a label. It's just plain smart. And a hat is a really great idea. That's not on most of the labels, but it makes a lot of sense. And eye protection. And the label is very specific about what's, what's needed for each of the herbicides, but know your PPE. Okay, we're going to go just a few more slides, and then we're going to get into some answer and question uh, time. Soil basal and spot treatments. I talked about hexazinone already. We've got Velpar, and there are other products out there. Uh, in fact, one just came into the, you know, from the Hel Hel Helen has a new product that's a liquid, but we really needed a solvent. A solid would really be useful at this point. But anyway, we're doing application to individual roots, rootstocks in this case. For trees, we use two to four mils of, of uh, product undiluted per inch of stem diameter. And for brush, we can go around individual ones about three feet. Uh, uh, for every three feet of canopy width, we do two to four milliliters of product. Now, that's what the label says, but you really want to dilute this about 50% because with uh, the undiluted Velpar, it'll gum up your, your application equipment. I think the, some of the newer labels are showing that. There's a lot of some products out there that, that show that dilution, but we learned that the hard way pretty quick. Okay, mid-rotation release. This is a way that we go into a lot of situations that didn't have good site prep and they have a lot of carbon. And there is a good return if you use good selective treatments and give some time for that stand to respond to the release, the removal of the competing vegetation, You're basically reallocating the available resource to produce usable wood uh, just like release, this is a late summer, early treatment, and the rates are very similar as in release, a little bit higher rates because the trees are older. Okay. We also do work in the understory for the same objective. And here, a lot of this is done in the coastal plain in particular. Uh, but that it's common in, in the, uh, the Gulf states also, so throughout the coastal plain there. These are applications below the canopy with these herbicides, common treatments that we used in, in site preparation. Now these are less than selective because we're under the canopy, okay? So if we went over the top with these things, we would kill our trees. But these herbicides are not soil active. And for that reason, well, Escort is the only exception that we, um, we have selectivity in the understory. Okay, I'm going to talk just a little bit about timber and wildlife stand improvement. There are a lot of objectives that are consistent with pine production. One thing is individual stem treatments will remove individual uh, trees that are diseased. Uh, we can leave them in st standing trees, which is great for wildlife, which I've learned in the last few years, working with Holly Ober, one of our professors, dead is wood, that's our new mo motto. And also we can promote desired species. It's good to have a mix of, right, of red and white oaks in particular for, for deer mass, uh, because different, different uh, flowering and, and uh, productivity in different seasons. Um, persimmon can be a very viable wildlife species. American beauty, beauty berry is one. And also for forbs, uh, broadleaves, in another word, that can be important. 
for many species, but that's a whole different lecture right there. Okay, we're gonna talk very quickly about some of the, the common individual stem treatments for those objectives. For hack and squirt, when you have a few tall trees, this is the best fit that you've got, typically starting at about four inches. Uh, and, and that's only because of the practicality of uh, trying to do a hatchet on a very small stem. It is done, it can be done, but it just, it, you know, just it's more effective and reasonable for a large stem. And you, the, the labels do a good job of describing the spacing of the cuts. Some of them are wide space, some are close, and here are the more common herbicides that are placed in individual stem. What I like about this is that it uses very little herbicide. It's very inexpensive for the herbicide. The labor though is more significant. It's very labor intensive. That's why you don't want to do a stand that is very dense. There are other, other treatments could be better. Basal stem, this is for multiple stem form, sprouting species. There are many of those that we deal with. This is often done during the dormant season when we can operate comfortably. And these are applications to the lower 12 to 15 inches of the individual stem. I recommend that you use a basal oil, uh, which improves the absorption through the bark and, and improves better efficiency for the herbicide. And garlon is a very common one. Chepper, uh, chopper, which is in mazapir, uh, is very effective. But recognize if you're working with a mazapir, you've got a soil active and you've got residual and you can be wanting to leave some standing hardwood that you desire and do this treatment near them, they may even be connected to the same root system. So when you're doing hardwood management, stay away from the mazicure. Cut stump, that is an easy technique, very effective. There's a lot of treatments that you can use for that. A lot of products are out there that do that. It's an old, old, timey uh, treatment, but it's best to do this on fresh cut stone. And for most of the products, where you want to concentrate your application is right on the can, right inside of the bark, where you see here in green in this particular photo, which I believe is from Jim Miller. Okay, we're going to finish up with the new forestry herbicide la labels that we have. Uh, I, there, are, there are a lot out there. There's a lot of generics that are out there and uh, they tend to cover a lot of the same ground, but we've got some new labeling, new products, which I, I really want to talk about. And I picked three here for this presentation. We're going to start with Milestone VM, which I see uh, is a common, is a treat of. It includes aminopyrrolid and also triclopyr, a combination of those together. And that's from Corteva, which was Dow AgriScience and also Monsanto, uh, they merged. And then Esplande uh, F, which is a uh, oncoming uh, material that shows a lot of promise from there. And then Detail is also coming out from BASF. That's been out for a while. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Milestone here. This again, as I said, that's a combination of triclopyr and amino pyrrolid. It's predominantly a uh, triclopyr, but amino pyrrolid is a very strong herbicide. So it, it, it's there at, at a relatively high rate relative to its uh, limits to the acre, acre uh, uh, limit, max, maximum amount per acre. This is for selective control of broadleaf weeds and woody plants and conifer forests. All species here, all right. I've seen this, I was out uh, in the West doing, doing California wheat tour. I used to part of that group. And, uh, and we saw some of the research and was really impressed with the tolerance and it's pretty well developed now in the West and we're coming along with information and, and, uh, and in fact, that is a very promising material. 
It's useful for site preparation, directed spray applications, and individual stem treatments, ISD. For site prep, the rates are nine pints per acre. Uh, you want to add, you want to use high volume, depending on the application method, but typically you want good coverage with this material, and you do want to add an, uh, a surfactant. It's used as a directed spray now uh, at the rate of nine pints per 100 gallons. So rather than a rate per acre, this is a concentration, which makes sense for directed spray because you have so much in the container and you spray individual stems. It's kind of hard to do that on a per acre uh, uh, basis. Now this is very effective for selective brush and established broadleaf control. That's something that, uh, that we need that. There's a lot of stands where we miss herbaceous weed control and folks will call at the end of the year and my pines are choked out by ragwood, whatever it is. Uh, and we don't have a whole lot of options, but this is one of them. It's also used for various individual stem treatments. I just talked about that. And uh, also I wanna just mention that Milestone VM is the amino pyrrolid alone, which has a state floral, Florida uh, special local need label 24C for selective release and long leaf planets, plantings. And that's true for most of the Southeast states as well. Those are individual state, uh, special need labels for each of the states. Espelande, which is uh, a bear product that has come out uh, and being, it's been used effectively uh, for conifer and hardwood product production areas for both conifer and hardwoods, for site preparation and post-plant herbaceous weed control. This is not a standalone material. It's used as a post-emergent herbicide, okay? So after the weeds uh, are uh, uh, for a post, included a post-emergence herbicide because it's a pre-emergence and doesn't control established weeds. Uses very low rates, three and a, and a half to seven ounce per acre. The maximum rate per acre is 10 ounces. Very wide spectrum control of grasses and broadleaf weeds and the log residuals, a very long residual. And that's very attractive. Uh, I have here the half light, life is 150 days and that's by the Weed Science Society of America herbicide handbook. That's what I'm citing here. This has very good tolerance. Very impressed with that uh, uh, for many conifer and hardwoods. Uh, Loblolly, slash, longly, slope, short leaf, and Virginia pine are currently labeled. Oak plantations are on the label, and a recent cell sheet I saw, they also had sweet gum. So I guess they're adding that to the label as also. Typically for site prep, we're going to tank mix with a Mazapir, uh, that's the Arsenal chopper, chopper Sophometron, Alice, Triclopyr, Garlon. For herbaceous weed control, mixing with Vilpar DF, that's Hexazenum, Alice, or Alstar. Put those actives there. Uh, please note that it is toxic to fish. Many, some herbicides, some other herbicides are and there is potential for leaching. Uh, application is by air is by helicopter only. The, um, the interesting thing to me with this material is that the mode of action is different than most of the products we're using right now. It inhibits cellulose synthesis. And we want to try to use different modes of action when we combine herbicides. And the reason for that is that Resistance will develop uh, as plants adapt to our common and uh, often in areas where we do often repeated application. That's not a usual thing in, in forestry. We do it infrequently. 
but in many cases in farming, my gosh, we're doing many applications in a single growing, growing species, uh, season, uh, orchards, other things. So the populations can develop in other areas and move into our forests. That, that's a reality. And, um, and I'll close by saying it has low toxicity. Most new pro the products that are coming out have very low toxicity because there's a lot of competition with existing products right now. Lastly, detail, uh, which is a BASF product. And this uh, is used for site preparation for control of wildling uh, will, will, <laughs> pines, uh, wild pines and other plants prior to planting conifers and hardwoods. As I, we talked about pine control and, and it's difficult to, to do this, but uh, this is something that's coming along. I've seen about a half of a, a dozen sites where this has been used on um, many, many acres with one client who's working with sand pine, didn't work with sand pine, but I, don't, I wouldn't hold that uh, against them because uh, that, that species of sand pines next to impossible, it is impossible to control a herbicide. But we look forward to seeing more information from the manufacturer about its efficacy uh, for these uses. The label uh, indicates that you need to combine this with glyphosate at the rate of glyphosate, which is re recommended for pine control. This is a protox inhibitor. And this is among some new materials, new mode of action, as we were talking about just a second ago. This inhibits the uh, form of formulation, uh, the forming of chlorophyll mo molecule. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a different mode of action. That's good to have that in our combinations. It's notable that this is very a short residual material, one to six, 36 days is the half-life. And again, low toxicity. I'm going to close by, uh, there's a lot of folks here today that are with the American Tree Farm System. And I need to let you know, Chris has asked me to mention this, that there's a need for, cert for certification now. You need to have records of your herbicide applications. And this is important, not just for a certifica certification, but also for, for, uh, for future management. You know, many times the first thing I'll ask, what was the history with this track? You know, what were the treatments that were, were done? We have to build on what was done on the past. And it's just good to, to uh, have a record that includes what was applied, you know, the, the product, the amount per acre, when it was applied and where it was applied. So that's, uh, that's just a good, a good uh, steward uh, effort right there. All right. Well, that uh, concludes, concludes, <laughs> concludes my presentation. Uh, take a look at our extension publications. Here's our website here for EDIS publications and also for all of the labels the to go place is the CDMS site and it's free. You can just put the name in there. You can get it, the current label right there. And it's a great uh, place to go get that information. Thank you very much uh, for your patience. And I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Chris. All right. Thank you, Pat. Great job. Well, we're a little over time now, but if you're willing to stick around and answer questions, we've got several uh, questions that have come in over the course of the webinar. We can go through them. Uh, we'll I'll just take them as they have come. Uh, one question here, uh, how do we better refine the site prep herbicide mix to preserve as much native ground cover as possible to maintain some wildlife habitat? You talked about selectivity during your, your presentation. Do you have anything else to add on that? Yes, I love that question, and that's, um, yeah. So one thing, you know, I started with a slide showing that you can release broom, broom sage spreads, broom sage, um, androcogon, and many of the warm season grasses, you know. So we select materials that are selective to that in site preparation. That's, that's just one example 
to do this, you have to understand the selectivity of individual species and, uh, and what products are selected for different species, right? A lot of it has to do with the rate that's used. Wiregrass, we can use arsenal, which is very spectrum, you know, wide spectrum and uh, for, for the grasses, you know, in, in a group, um, graminae, it's very effective. But if you use low rates, it will control the competition to wiregrass and release wiregrass. And we're working on that with the water management grass uh, district right now. This is, uh, that's why I'm really interested in this. It's all new ground, it really is. And it, and it requires a lot of understanding of the, the selectivity and timing is huge. Just, and that's a big question right there. But one thing I want to throw out is do what you can in the dormant season because your selectivity, selectivity is better there. And also individual stem treatments improve our uh, selectivity. That's selectivity by placement. Okay, that's a short answer to a huge question. Thanks for that one. All right, and this one I think is answered by your publication that you shared during your pres presentation. And you can access that, uh, that publication from the presentation slides, which are on that site I mentioned. But in your experience with the Mazapir, how long should one wait to plant pines after its application? Yeah, and that, that really, that, uh, that publication really gets to that for the different species and different sites. And again, it's that relationship between the amount you put out and when you plant. So that period there, because the herbicide's going to be decaying through time, right? So I think uh, that that body of research that's reported right there is, is a great go-to. Okay. Uh, I've had a couple of questions about Velpar L. Um, what company is producing Velpar L VU now? It seems Bayer is no longer producing it. Well, I know uh, one for sure, and I'm surprised about there you know, that uh, a lot of the DuPont materials came through um, to bear. But right now, Helena has a new product and a new label. It's a more concentrated formulation. The label's different. It really is different than the Velcro, the Velcro RL. Uh, the rates, uh, the, the upper end of rates are higher. Uh, a lot of the information is a carryover from the uh, earlier formulations, and that's what you're seeing. But whenever products come off of patent, patent, uh, patent, often it's being made in the same plant, but it's going out under other labels. And uh, I won't get into that, but that is, you know, from my experience in being in the industry for 15 years and, and with Dow and, and uh, everybody but Monsanto, I think. It just, uh, it's a very dynamic market, it really is. I think that uh, Velpar L, uh, you know, it has very effective fits and we wanna, uh, we wanna have that available. But again, uh, it, it has to be, be done with stewardship because it has high water solubility. Uh, I won't go into that farther. All right, we've got a uh, question about using arsenal a couple times during the year. Is it okay to use arsenal in the mix in the fall and then again in the spring, or was that too much in the soil? Great question. And in fact, that same publication that we just did with the University of Jan uh, you know, it, it answers that question. Uh, a lot of times when I'm doing a site prep treatment, you know, uh, I'll ask, are you gonna use herbaceous weed control? And you know, I might go with a mazapir for site prep because that's gonna be stronger controlling the hardwood. But then if I come back with herbaceous weed control in April, then I'll, I'll switch to the active ingredient and I'll, I'll change over to uh, Alston Velpar or Alstar and use a different mode of action there. And, and then another thing I want to add is your, your question is right on target, is that a lot of times we're putting oust or escort in with the site prep mix with the mazapir 
and then we come out and do herbaceous weed control. Now we have three or two <laughs> herbicides with the same mode of action being applied tw uh, uh, twice. So it's about rate and timing, persistence, and uh, it's a you know it's dynamic. But there are some general rules in that publication. That's one of the things we added in the revision this last summer. Great question, thanks. All right, I got a question about controlling Smilax vine in longleaf or slash pine understory. Yeah, it's a, it, you know, it's a difficult species to control, but the best thing actually is to do this. It can be done during the dormant season. Uh, it's easier to work with it then. Uh, you know, a lot of times if we're, it's, it's a problem with pine straw, I can tell you, and I, I do a lot of research on that, it's a problem. We use tripopyr um, around your garden. You can use a shovel and just dig out the, the uh, corn. Uh, it's like a, a, a tuber and, and that controls it. But the best thing that we're using right now is tripopyr and dormant season applications, including 1% of methylated seed oil, which improves the absorption. You don't want to spray it up into the crowns of the pines if it's climbing. You know, a lot of times we'll pull it off of the stems, lay it on the ground and then spray that. I can tell you, you're not going to get it in one shot. You're going to, you're going to be working on it for a couple of years. It's, it's a problem. Uh, I try to do something with it when I do site prep. And that's real common in as we go to second rotations. At times we don't have a whole lot of hardwood, particularly the coastal plain, but we have smilax and a lot of other perennial vines. That, that's that's the new target for site prep. Thanks. Any new herbicides out to control kogan grass, specific specifically in uh, longleaf pine? Yeah, uh, I love that question too. Uh, we have a publication on the EDIS site here, use uh, control of togon grass in conifer, in, in, um, in forest pines, in, in pine pines. Uh, it's recent, we just put that together. Jim Miller, Miller who's an expert, myself and others, uh, put this together. And the short answer to that is that in pines you use an azapir and life is safe. And it, uh, you, you, it's going to take more than one year to control togan grass. We often combine that with burning. So it's, it's not a battle, it's a war, but you can win that war. You can. And uh, please do take a look at that publication because uh, it gives specifics. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it with that. Okay, yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Redden, if you want to drop me a line, I can send you a link to that publication if you, if you have trouble finding it. Any advice on hairy indigo herbaceous control? Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's a great question too. And the best thing is to try to control that with pre-emergent control. The, um, you know, if you use combinations of mazapir and sulfametron, oust, arsenal together. Uh, that is somewhat effective. Uh, yeah, that's one of our problem species that we often deal with that late in the, in the uh, season. And I wish I had a, yeah, we got that one. Uh, we're still working on it, I think. As a start, do, do pre-emerge application and have the mass appear in that mix. I'll add the uh, Velpar is not very effective in the combinations there. Mm. Okay. And we had a question. I think you might have addressed this when we talked when you talked about Velpar earlier. Um, it was about the granular ULW um, version of Velpar went off, went out. Was that because of regulatory issues or because of you mentioned that markets had, had developing and changing over time, but. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know, the solids came out in part because of uh, cost of production was a part of that. The size of the market was relatively limited. It was great for our coastal forestry, for site prep, for longleaf restoration, sandy sites and all that. Um, you know, the ULW was a great fight fit. It was a small market. 
but a big part of it was the the groundwater constant uh, concern and uh, environmental issues with hexazinone. Through years, there there have been several fish kills which uh, have occurred following the use of hexazinone. It has very high water solubility, forty three thousand part per million uh, solubility, high solubility and potential to leach. Uh, so, you know, I'd like to see it for use, but I use it at low rates, the lowest rate that is needed and where it is the one that really fits. So, that, I think that answers your question. I don't, I'll finish it with this. I don't think any else, anybody else is gonna pick up the solid. I don't think that's gonna happen. Interesting. Oh, people are still on and asking questions. So we'll keep on going if you're game, Pat. Yeah, I'm sorry I went over, folks. I really, I, um, I had, knew I had a lot. I, I'm slower than I used to be, you know. Well, I know you've had this question before. Any suggestion for dog fennel in three to five-year-old slash and longleaf? Yeah, dog fennel. Now that's one, that's an interesting species um, because it's, it, it actually, it's a uh, perennial, you know, for uh, for two years. And so pre-emergent control is, a, is an important start. It's a real challenge on sites, but start with pre-emergent control, a combination of a mazapir and oust is very good. But also now uh, looking at milestone, milestone alone uh, using the state local uh, special need label you can do direct application and also the Milestone Plus product. That's a, that's a new option that we have for some of these almost woody, tall, herbaceous plants uh, on the broadleaf side that we haven't had in the past. We used 2,4-DP uh, in the past and then the tolerance to pines is not that good. But again, this is directed application. Uh, mowing is what I usually go to in the late season, if you can. If, if people have the equipment, you've got open rows, uh, you can do something with, with knowing. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Pat. That concludes all the questions. I got one, uh, we got some people looking for the PowerPoint uh, slides. Um, I'll, I'll can, I can help you out if you're having trouble finding that. Uh, Steve, I will send you the, uh, I'll send you the link directly if you're having trouble. Um, it's on the, um, you look at the reminder email you got about this webinar and there's another one coming out. Usually the link for some reason is at the very bottom of those emails. So scroll all the way to the bottom of that email underneath all the link information and uh, you'll find the link that goes right to the site where you can get those, those PowerPoints, PowerPoint slides. All right. Well, Pat, thanks so much for your, your time and your presentation today. It looks like it was well received. We had a lot of great questions and uh, there's still 43 people that have hung on to, to the very end to get the answers to those questions. So great job. Thank you all. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Have a great day. All right, and with that, we will conclude. Thank you very much. Please fill out that, uh, that evaluation that pops up at the end of this and we'll see you next time. See you, Pat.